agree upon as it relates to Pentecost because again our theme is preparing for Pentecost rekindling vibrance in every congregation um, we believe that every congregation is vibrant in its own way can the church say amen, amen. God has a certain way of speaking and a certain way of giving religious expression through each of our congregations. And all of them ought to be valued, amen, not as how we would like for them to be. Wouldn't that be wonderful if every church could be the church that you would like for it to be, amen? But your church, the congregation to which you belong, has value just as it is, amen? And we want to express how important that is to us. Uh, as I look at Pentecost, particularly the New Testament record of Pentecost, I believe it speaks to us in, in profound ways. And it talks to us about something that is vital, and that is unity within our community. It talks to us about what it means to be a united church. Is there somebody in here who might remember the story of Pentecost and the word accord? Amen. What does the Bible say about that? They, they, were, they were gathered together, all right, with one accord. Amen. I think that whole business of unity is is the, the author Luke just touches on it for us to, to get a glimpse of what our community, our local church ought to be like. And I remember the surveys that we did not too long ago. And in those surveys, I remember people expressing the idea, expressing that within our congregations, there is a lack of the ability to resolve our differences. Amen? So, you, so you, you know, an average church is like 25 or smaller. Amen? You, 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 you following me? 25 or smaller, and we've been in existence for a number of years, and there is some issue with resolving disputes within the church. And the early church, a group of people having lost their leader, a man having lost their leader to a form of execution, a man to a form of execution, and, and, and sort of gathered behind closed doors but yet under a hotly contested existence, they were together with one accord. Can you see the difference? Amen, can you see the difference? So, so I really wanna just point that out that unity is so very important. And unity is not the ability or not the willingness to come together and sing Kumbaya. That's good. That's a good thing. Amen. If we can come to sing, we come together and sing, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord. That's good to be able to do that. Creates a good feeling, but that's not necessarily what unity is. Uh, I have to watch my time here. Uh, what time did I say we would end? Uh, what time did I say we would end, though? 140. Okay. Okay. So, it's not... It's not just coming together and singing kumbaya, but unity is something that you strive for. Unity is something that you dig in your heels for. Unity is, is, is something that you drop your anchor on. That's what unity is about, amen? It's about dropping an anchor and the winds blowing the ship back and forth, but that bad boy doesn't move. <laughs> because it's anchored. Are you, are you following me? And the church has to anchor herself in unity. If not, we're gonna be blown and tossed 
to and fro by every wind that blows. Um, if unity were easy, if unity were easy, in his last prayer, amen, in his priestly prayer, praying before his crucifixion, Jesus would never have prayed that what? That they may be one. He would never need to do that. Not at that moment. If it was easy to do, Jesus would never have prayed that. So I want you to think about this now. Here's something that I want you to think about. I think this is a startling example of unity as it relates to the season of Pentecost. Do you remember who it was that came to town from all of these different countries and all of these different places? Do you remember? They were, I believe it's in chapter one, they were called devout. Do y'all remember that? Where, where is the scripture? Where, where is it? Get it for me. They were devout men and women. I, first of all, I want to see if we agree that that's what the word says. Amen. <laughs> is that what the word says? Devout men and women? So, can you find it for me real quick? It's a surprising, it's a surprising description. It's, it's almost shocking. Devout men and women. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews, devout men from every nation. And you say that means God-fearing. The New International call it God-fearing. So, so here's my question to you. Uh, the, 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 the season of Pentecost, the celebration of Pentecost, this is a pilgrimage feast. All right, so they were dwelling, they were, they were residing, they were on pilgrimage, they were coming to the, to the celebration of Pentecost. Now, let me ask you a question. They had three feasts, one was the Feast of Tabernacle, one was the Passover, the other one was Pentecost. So Passover comes right before Pentecost. So who would you say came to the celebration of Passover? Because the Bible says that as it relates to these feasts, uh, that it, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, it, I know it's in Deuteronomy, it's in chapter, uh, uh, I believe it's chapter 16 and 19, it talks about your devout men shall come and celebrate, you know, these feasts. So they will be devout men. Do you, who, what would be the difference between the folk who celebrated Pentecost and the folk who celebrated Tabernacles? Is there, is there going to be a large difference? If I'm the guy who pastors such and such a, a, a synagogue in, in, in such and such, in Syria, and, and it's the main synagogue, it's the number one synagogue, am I gonna go to the Feast of Tabernacles? I'm gonna go, because that's my role. Because Deuteronomy tells me that I, in order to be in covenant, I'm gonna go to that feast. I'm gonna go to the next feast, it's like annual conference. Amen, it's like an annual conference, it's like a general conference. I'm going to go to the next feast. Same folk. Amen. It don't really change. Look at the annual conference. Look at the spring meeting. Look at the winter meeting. You see the same faces. Isn't that right? And so here you would see the same faces. Do y'all believe that or do you get where I'm coming from? Do y'all get it or no? Am I losing anybody? All right. So here's where I, here, here is my, here is my catcher. All right, here's my hook. That if the devout Jews who would go to one feast are the same devout Jews who would go to the next feast, that the same folk 
who were there at the Feast of Tabernacles. They were there for the Feast of Passover. And if they were there for the Feast of Passover, they were there, amen, on Palm Sunday. And they were in the crowd, amen, shouting Hosanna. But if they were there on Palm Sunday, they were also there on Good Friday. <laughs> Amen. And they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And if they were there on Good Friday, they were sitting around the cross, standing there hurling insults at him. Amen. Are you following me? These are the same folks. So I'm looking at this scripture. I'm saying, Luke, you know good and well, these are the same people. These are the same people that were yelling and screaming at Jesus. These were the same people that were saying, crucify Jesus. And here you are in Acts chapter 1 calling them devout men. And I'm saying to myself, they weren't devout. These are the biggest traitors, hypocrites, backbiting. Amen. But Luke is saying something different to us. Luke is saying that what we must do in order to be church, in order to have Pentecost, you got to reclaim your community. In order to be Pentecost, you can't let Good Friday mess you up because we were all there in the same spot. Amen. I might not have been shouting crucify him, but I sure enough deserted him. I sure enough denied him. Amen. I sure enough left him behind. I sure enough, are you following me? Amen. I, 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 I wasn't there either. So we all need to realize. I, I don't know. For, for me, that exploded in my head that Luke would say that. But then again, to me, it was a message to the church that there are some things. We always say this. There is no church like a hurt church. There's no hurt like a church hurt. And I said, who said that? Where is that in the Bible? Amen. Where is that in the Bible? We treat that expression like it's word. There is, we treat it like it's scripture. There is no church like a hurt church. I, like a church hurt. I see a church hurt here. I see a church hurt. I see these people as folk who hurt the church. Amen. That's what I see. But I see Luke saying, no, this is the church. And I see Luke saying, if you're going to have a Pentecost in your congregation, you got to reclaim the folk who did the stuff on Good Friday. You got to reclaim them. You got to embrace them. Put your arms around them. You got to bring them into the fold. You got you to gotta allow the Holy Spirit to get them in an upper room situation. It's your job. It's my job. It's our job to get them in an upper room situation. And it's the Holy Ghost's job to set them on fire. <laughs> And if we don't get them in an upper room situation, then the Holy Ghost can't do his job. But if we get them in the Holy Ghost situation, in the upper room situation, the Holy Ghost can do the job that only the Holy Ghost can do. Amen. I put it like this. You might be, you might look one way on Good Friday. Amen. But if you can hold them in the upper room, when the day of Pentecost is fully come, you all look the same. <laughs> Folk don't see you anymore. They all see the fire that God has placed within you. Oh, somebody ought to get happy on that today. But oh, that's a challenge for me as a bishop it's a challenge for us as pastors. It's a challenge. It's a challenge for us because God is calling us to be bigger and God is calling us to be better than what we are. And God is saying that this is the reason that I died. The real reason that I died is to redeem those who did what they did, amen, who did and said 
what they said and acted the way that they acted. Jesus said, that's exactly why I died on the cross. Exactly why I died on the cross. And that's exactly why our unity is important. Because when you can show the devil, Lord have mercy, when, when, when you can show the devil and when you can show the world what the redeeming love of God is all about, Amen. When you can show the world sees the love of the church and the world's eyes gets big and say, I've never seen love like this. That's where we have to be. And it's a difficult place to be and it's a tough place to be, but that's where God calls us to be. And that's, that's, that's why I'm looking at this season of Pentecost and really just challenging the church, amen, to look at how important our unity really is, to look at how important our unity really is, and just to listen to Luke talk about these persons. And I said, boy, those little devils, and you're calling them devout, and Luke said, no, they were devout. They were doing what they knew to do. They were doing what they were trained to do. And we have trained so many people to get in corners like little pit bulls and fight each other. We have trained them. Go ahead on and admit it. We have trained them as bishops, as pastors. We have trained them to take sides, amen, and throw a bone in the middle of the floor and come out fighting. Amen. We have trained folk not to forgive. But once we start training people to forgive, amen, forgiveness will be the rule of the day. Once we train people to love others like Jesus loved us, that becomes the rule for the day. Amen. And it can change, and it will change, and we believe it, because what this is about is rekindling. And if anybody knows about fire, amen, if anybody knows about fire, you know that, they're, that if you put logs and set them on fire, they will go out. Amen, they will not burn all the way through. They will go out. But boy, as soon as you start stirring, amen, as soon as you start fanning. And what God is asking us to do, God is saying, I know it looks dead. Amen, that's what God is saying about our churches. I know it looks dead, but God is just saying, but just fan, amen. God is saying, but just get in and just stir up the gifts that is within you. And the next thing you know, you have a fire that's burning brightly, you have a blaze that the world cannot put out. Amen? And, and so that, that calls me to the last point, or the last thing that I think about. Um, in that scripture that you read in, 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 in um, um, let's see, the one that I called out was Deuteronomy 16 and 16, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. Now, that scripture right there, Deuteronomy 16 and 16, tells me that it might not have been exactly the same group, but many of the same people who attended one feast would also attend the next and the next. And it tells me that many of those Jews would be the persons who would have called for the crucifixion of Jesus. All right? And it tells me that when Luke calls them devout, Luke is all scripture <laughs> is inspired by God. Luke is not just talking and just, amen, this is not fiddle faddle. Luke is being very intentional. And I believe that is for the church to see a picture of the power of unity in the early church. Um, now, but there's another picture being painted here. Not a lot is being said about it. And that's, I believe it's chapter one, uh, verse 14. And it says, they all join together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So these are the people who were there for the day of Pentecost. And what I want you to see is Deuteronomy 16 and 16. Three times a year, all of your what? Males shall appear 
before the Lord your God. All of your males shall appear. But in this case, season of Pentecost, they were all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. So there were women who came uh, to the Pentecost celebration. And just to move things along very quickly, um, the males had to come. That's the commandment. All of them shall, it doesn't say may, it says shall appear three times a year. The males had to be there. The women didn't have to be there. Journeys to Jerusalem could take up to 40 days to get there. If when you went on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you carried a, a sacrifice or you purchased a sacrifice when you got there, but the underlying understanding was that if you were willing to take a 40 day journey and you didn't travel by jet, plane, or train, amen, uh, it was one of the roughest things that you could ever endure. You were in danger. Everything that you had was in danger. Everything that you left was in danger at your house. You remember those stories? Jesus would say, a man went off into a far country. And when he went, uh, uh, when he came back, things were not <laughs> as they were when he left. Those kinds of situations were stories of recollection that people would have from pilgrimage experiences. So here you have the command for men to leave, but in the Bible you have a record that women were there. So to have a Pentecost experience is going to mean that we have to pay the price for unity, but it also means that we're going to have to go above and beyond the call of duty. The way I want these women to be seen in this text, I believe that it paints a picture for us that some people did what they had to do and Pentecost happened. But there were some people who were doing what they didn't have to do and they did it anyway and Pentecost happened. Pentecost just doesn't necessarily just happen. But there has, there's a process underlying Pentecost. And when, it's, when some people are willing to go beyond the call of duty, you don't just stop at what you're required to do, but you go above and beyond. And that's, that's the female presence in Pentecost. It's above and beyond the call of duty. And, and you never quite get this clear until you just read Luke and put all of what Luke has to say in perspective the women uh, who discovered the empty tomb. Amen? The women who discovered. Luke says there was an earthquake. And Luke doesn't say it was just an earthquake. He said it was violent. Amen? But the women came to the tomb anyway. That's going above, amen, and beyond. Are y'all with me? It's going above and beyond. If you take the whole record of the Gospels, the women didn't know if they were going to be able to move the stone, didn't know if they were going to be able to access Jesus, had no idea whether or not, amen, they were going to be able to get anything done, but yet they took everything necessary, bought about 75 pounds of spices, and women carried 75 pounds of spices without a wheelbarrow, amen, carried it, to the tomb, and they left their house early in the morning. And most texts say early in the morning. Matthew says early, Mark and Luke talk about early, but John just tells it like it is. John just said it was dark. Amen. <laughs> he said it was dark. So even though it was morning, it was dark. Even though it was day, it was dark. It was the darkest part of the day. And what, what the Bible is trying to say is here you have women leaving their house early in the morning. I just want to say it like it is. There's no scripture that I can recall that says women can't bury a man. But all I know is if you can't speak to a man in public, amen, if you can't be in a gathering of men in public, are you following me? And if in this day and time, uh, I think it's even true now, 
in Orthodox Judaism that women can't partake of burying a man and men can't partake in burying a woman. I don't know how it was then, but I'm going to guess that it wasn't very much different. And I imagine that's probably one of the reasons why they got up early in the morning because they knew Jack and Jane and Jim and James was going to be angry. What? You, you going to, uh, who? Amen. Not, not my mother, not my sister, not my wife. Oh, no, no, you're not going to touch a man, even if he's dead, but the women said, we're going to do it anyway. They go above and they go beyond. And that's how you, that's how Pentecost happens in churches. That if you think just doing the ordinary is going to get it done, rethink that. If you think just going along to get it done, to get along is going to do it, rethink that. Know that in order for God to do the exceptional and the extraordinary and the supernatural in your church, every now and then you got to act like you know that God is getting ready to do something supernatural in your lives, in your church, in your situation, and just open that thing up for God to do a breakthrough. And that's what the women in these texts for me are an example of, and that is going above and going beyond. So when it comes to witnessing to the law, when it comes to sharing your faith with those, amen, who are still in the world, when it comes to reaching out to people who have been disconnected from the church, be like Paul. Paul says, it was to the Jews, I'm going to be a Jew. To the Gentiles, I'm going to be a Gentile. Paul says, I'm trying to be everything for all people because Paul says I don't want to lose in this business of eternal life I don't want to have a tie in this business of eternal life I want to win some I want to win some and God needs a church that's saying we want to win I'm tired of losing tired of losing tired of seeing our young people lost Tired of seeing our relatives lost. Just tired of seeing folk who are good folk, folk who are doing the wrong thing, but have the capacity to do the right thing. God is saying he needs us to have a heart that says, I believe I can win this thing. And I believe I can win this thing. Amen. And that's what it's all about. So we have to go above and beyond. I look at look at Sister Carolyn Stafford, and I know she wouldn't want me to give this example, but I'm giving it anyway. Amen. And that is when they were getting ready to have this 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 meeting for the missionaries. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm a bishop, and I was saying, oh, this is gonna be this is not gonna be good. Amen. <laughs> but every time we got on the line, oh, we can do it, Bishop. We can do it, Bishop. Oh, yes, we can do it. And I'm sitting there not saying what I'm feeling, amen, but feeling what I'm not saying, amen. And 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 all you could hear was, we'll do it, we'll get it done, we'll make it happen. We believe we can handle it. And you know what? They handle that thing. You got to go above and you got to go beyond and you have to believe that God is going to do the extraordinary. And that's when a Pentecost experience happened. And I've seen Pentecost happen. And I've seen it happen against folk who, uh, in the midst of folk who just thought it was ordinary. Who just thought nothing was going on. But in the reality Pentecost was happening. Because here, here, at the service of Pentecost, I want you to know that most of the Jews were at home. Most of the Jews did not know anything about the resurrection of Jesus. They were at home. Most of the Jews didn't know anything about the Feast of Tabernacles. They were at home. Amen. So for them, it was just ordinary. But in the midst of the ordinary, God was doing the extraordinary. And all I got to say is, brother, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it ain't happening. Just because you can't feel it doesn't mean that God ain't moving. Just because you can't define it doesn't mean that God hadn't changed my situation. Just because your eyes ain't open doesn't mean that God is not doing a new thing. And God is doing new things in this church. Everybody can't see it. You at home. But God is working. God is moving. 
Amen. Not through the majority. The majority never come along. The majority never take the trip. The majority never do the pilgrimage. But through the minority, God is making changes. Stride through the minority, through the smallest group. God is doing the new thing. Amen. It's 1045, 11, 145. Time to take a lunch break. God bless you and God keep you. Thank you. So let us have our lunch and we'll come back in a couple of hours. God bless you. Okay. 3.30. Can we pray? All right. For those who would like prayer, for those who would like prayer, come on up. Let's pray. Amen. Come on up. Let's just pray. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, in the midst of this moment, in the midst of this hour, we seek your face. On behalf of these pastors and these leaders who left their home, we seek your face. We ask, Heavenly Father, right now, Hallelujah. in the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. that you would help us not to despise the day of small things. Lord, right now, we believe in a snowballing effect. We believe that you're just moving in your churches. And we don't believe you just got started now. <laughs> But we believe that you've been doing it all along. And we believe that there is a prophetic voice saying, open their eyes that they might see. Encourage your people. Encourage your congregations through us. And Lord, we're so divided. But help us to yield to your spirit. Help us to yield to Holy Spirit that we might come together again. Help us to get over ourselves, to put down the weight of our grudges, and to be able to find your presence. And Lord, when I look at my neighbor, I don't want to see them. I want to see you. When I look at my neighbor, I don't want to see their face, but I want to see the cross. And I want to see what redemption looks like. And it looks just like the face of my neighbor. And to my neighbor, may my face also be the same. We are redeemed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church say, amen. reminder that the food trucks are located outside. Please make sure you visit the food trucks. Thank you.
do you want to go and not
people act as ushers. They are ushers. They just move us, move us from the back. All right. So come closer. That's right. I need you. I need you to come closer because our microphones are not working. So come closer. <laughs> All right. So now, so we would ask you not to sit at the back, but to come closer. Because what happens, here's how you're helping us. What happens is, and every preacher in the house will help me on this. What happens is, is when we see people at the back, even though you can hear us, we automatically assume that you can't. And so we push our voices harder. So you're making it actually easy on us because speaking is what we do all the time. So since we see that, it, it psychologically just causes us to have that physical reaction. So uh, if you all will come from the back, please, and come closer. And I thank you for the accommodation. Amen. I thank you for the accommodation. All right. And ushers, if you would just help us not to let people occupy the back seats. That would, that would be helpful. And if they want to occupy the back, I'm not against that. Just, just have them help you. <laughs> All right. All right. And we're good? Okay. So, let us uh, begin. Elder, do you want to begin with a few words? Thank you so much. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. And God, we just thank you for this morning training. We ask you, God, that your Holy Spirit be still with us, fresh and anew in our heart and mind. God, we ask you to bless our speakers, our teachers may come from this meeting more energized to go back to our various churches. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. We have a selection of our song from our Reverend Lisa Reed from Faith uh, CME Church. Our pastor is uh, Reverend Dr. Sandra Gripper. Amen. Amen. Now we don't want to want you to watch her sing. We want to help her to sing. Amen. Can we do that?
Come on, let's sing it. If I live right, I come on. If I live right, I what you be doing somewhere listening for mine. And I be somewhere And I be somewhere A list And I be somewhere Listening for my name And I be somewhere A listening I be somewhere Listening, I be somewhere. Listening for my name. Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. I be somewhere. Listening for my name. Amen. I remember my mother and my grandmother used to sing that song when I was a little boy. Amen. You didn't have to have music and drums and a beat. All you need is your feet and hands and clap. Amen. And I can see them old saints get happy right there in church. Amen. Amen. They didn't need nobody to pump them up because they already pumped up when they got up this morning. Amen. And you ought to be pumped up now because God been good to you. Amen. Amen. Just, just look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, when he called my name. I be somewhere listening for my name. My name is written in the book of life. When he calls me, I don't have to worry about it. Go get my badge because I be on my way. I don't know about you. Cause God been good to me. Have God been good to you? Some of y'all ain't shake your hand. You ain't move your head. You ain't stomp your feet. But maybe God ain't been good to you. Maybe you down in the dumps. But look at your neighbor one more time. Say, neighbor, you ain't smile. You ain't clap your hand. You ain't stomp your feet. I know what's wrong with you. The Bible says you're going to weep for a night. But joy. Anybody know about joy? Joy will come in the morning. Joy. Let's turn around to your neighbor. I got joy. I may not look it, but I got joy. I may not have a lot of money, but I got joy. I may good God, I got joy. Woo! Hallelujah! I say hallelujah! I say hallelujah! I say praise God! Good God. I be somewhere listening. The elder won't be calling my name. The bishop won't be calling my name. But Jesus, I said they got a song about it. Say he knows your name. And <sighs> praise God. Amen. <sighs> it's just good to be alive. It's just good to be in the number. God have brought us out of COVID-19. Not that we are better than anybody else that died in COVID-19, but somehow or another we made it. And we don't have a time, we don't have an option when we come to church to sit there like a bump on the log, but we ought to give God praise. You ain't got to pump me up, I don't have to pump you up, but you ought to thank God that I'm glad to be in the number just one more time. <laughs> Ooh. I, bitches, bitches say not to pray. I'm not going to pray. Uh, let me 
Let me give you my testimony. I, all my people are Baptists. My daddy was a Baptist preacher. But I had a friend, his daddy was a Methodist preacher in the CME church. But I want to go to the CME church because that's where all the women were, pretty ladies were. Y'all ain't saying nothing. But I stayed in the Methodist church because they did something for the young people. And that's why I'm in the CME church. And the CME church been good to me. Can I get a witness here? All you need to do is look outside your church wall. There's some drug addict. There's some uh, prostitute. There's some children. Amen. Need to hear the word of God. All they need is somebody with a smile on their face. Said, child, it could have been me. But let me tell you what God can do in your life. God have brought us a mighty long way. You didn't make it on your own. Don't get cute. That's because you work in the office with them. Don't get cute. Because you're only working there because they, they signed a law for you to work in there. But if it had not been for the black church, if it had not been for the black preachers, it had not been for those that march to get where we are, because your mom and daddy prayed for you. And they said, I want my children to have a better life. So now we are able to praise God. Amen. We ought, we ought to be excited and happy that we're on the Lord's side. Because we could have been dead. We was in the clubs. We were drinking anything we were drinking. Smoking what we want to smoke and did what we want to do. But thank God, he looked down. I, I got to I gotta let you go. I got to let you go. But just, just do that. You was, almost, you was almost going to hell, but he said... All right, we got to go. 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 Ah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.